Electricast. Yeah, I think personally, when I watch a film where there's like any patriotism involved, I'm like, blech, you know what I mean? But this was showing another part where I was like, this democracy is kind of nasty. Like, what am I, what side am I on, you know? That's what the film's about. Welcome to Generation Film, the podcast where two guys from the 20th century select a classic movie to show a panel of young filmmakers and see if it still plays for today's generation. My name is Mark Netter. I'm an instructor at the Los Angeles Film School. I'm co-founder of Electrocast Media, and I have been a filmmaker in the past. Uh, hi, I'm David Tausick, and I'm still on strike. When will it end? Hi, my name is Grace Chapman. I'm a student at the Los Angeles Film School and a film lover. Hi, I'm Jake Flowers. I'm also a student at the Los Angeles Film School, and I am a future PR and image consultant. Hi, I'm Kylie LaRue. I'm a recent graduate of USC's Film School, um, specializing in cinema and media studies. Great. Well, this past week, all of us watched the 1941 Depression-era drama Meet John Doe, which was directed by Frank Capra, written by Robert Riskin from a story by Richard Connell and Robert Presnell Jr., with stars Gary Cooper, Barbara Stanwyck, Edward Arnold, Walter Brennan, and James Gleason. David, this film in particular was your selection. And why don't you give us a synopsis? So the film starts with D.B. Norton, although we don't see him. He's working. D.B. Norton, a fascist millionaire, buys a newspaper and immediately lays off a good portion of the staff, including columnist Ann Mitchell, played by Barbara Stanwyck. So infuriated, she puts a letter in the paper railing against unemployment and society's ills, and she signs it, John Doe. Uh, the depression is on, extremism is growing, and the letter goes viral. So editor Henry Connell decides to rehire Anne with a scheme to boost circulation by exploiting her fake news. To play John Doe, they hire John Willoughby, Gary Cooper, a homeless former minor league pitcher in need of money to repair his arm. Anne writes a series of articles in Doe's name, doubling down on the original letter's anger about society's disregard for those in need. Willoughby gets 50 bucks, new clothes, gets a fancy hotel suite to share with his hobo buddy, the Colonel, who wants nothing to do with society and its trappings. And then D.B. Norton gives Anne a raise to write rousing radio speeches for John Doe. Willoughby, won over by his attraction to Anne and the promise of getting surgery, starts to worry about where this scam is going. But Anne's speeches are drawing Americans together into a grassroots movement for the people against cynical and overprivileged politicians. It all comes to a head when D.B. Norton's real motives are revealed and the well-meaning but truth-bending people he's been using have to reckon with some momentous moral choices with the destruction of American democracy at stake. Grace, this movie is 82 years old. Oh. <laughs> and I assume this is the first time you've ever seen it. Mm -hmm. What was your initial reaction? What are you thinking today? Well, I liked it from the beginning. I liked the tenacity of Anne Mitchell, um, even though her tactics were a bit questionable with the fake news and everything. But um, at that time, people were just really desperate for money. We were recovering from the Depression. So her actions really weren't that bad compared to a lot of other things going on. So I totally felt for her. And I just really loved her like can-do attitude and her tenacity. Hmm. And I loved all the like baseball references. It just is super nostalgic for me. This movie really reminded me of my grandparents and my my great grandma. And it, I really enjoyed it for that aspect. Jake, what was your reaction when you saw it? And again, I'm assuming this is the first time you've ever seen it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Capra is the director of my favorite movie. So I know it's going to be good. It happened one night. It's my favorite film. And I didn't even know about this movie weirdly enough, but I really loved it, loved the costuming. I think the sentiment's relatable. And I think that, like Grace said, her tenacity, I was just like addicted to her crazy rambling monologues, like in her accent. I was like, oh, she's badass, I love her. 
And even though her tactics were kind of terrible, I still was rooting for her. Nice. Kylie, was this the first time you've seen the movie? Yes, it was. Yeah. Had you heard of it before? I had never heard of it. No. Mm -mm. So what was your reaction? um, And was there anything that surprised you in particular? I liked it. I teared up a couple times in some of the speeches because I'm just a sucker for that stuff. But I really enjoyed it. And I definitely could feel the tension from the end of the Depression and the cusp of World War II. You could just kind of feel Capra's, um, because you know, he's Sicilian, like, so am I. I've heard the war stories. And I was like, okay, yes, I can definitely tell that he's grappling with at home, the Mussolini fascism happening, but then also rooting for America as a new home. And I thought there was such graceful angst in the movie, but yet the Capricorn, as they call it, um, Mm -hmm. I could feel that, but it was kind of lower, a bit more pessimistic because you could just tell that he was coming from a place where it's like, I really hope this doesn't happen, but I think it might. And let's just all band together and really, really enjoy each other. But the Christian elements to it was, I think, the most surprising to me, the iconography of Jesus, the Christ-like figure, and then all the alluding to Christmas and rebirth, that to me was like something I did not expect. Even though It's a Wonderful Life has that, I didn't expect it to be so religious and kind of elusive to the Bible in some ways. You know, that's so interesting that you bring that up. The point that really hit me was towards the end when Barbara Stanwyck's giving a big speech, and she says the original John Doe 2,000 years ago you know, meaning Jesus, of course. But it's interesting because it reminds me of a kind of attitude towards religion from when I was a kid, which was, it was okay to discuss it. You weren't proselytizing. You know, it wasn't like you're necessarily forcing it. It was sort of like, aren't these all lessons that we all can live by? That all makes sense. You know, be kind to your fellow person, you know, those kinds of things. So to me, that was kind of interesting about the, uh, religious aspect. And certainly this guy, John Willoughby, who takes on the role of John Doe, becomes a Christ-like figure. And I think, you know, Cooper's performance really comes into its own in the last couple scenes. And he really goes from being this happy-go-lucky guy to kind of having the weight of the world on his shoulders in, in an amazing way. And it's, it's not the Jesus that's come down to us through American religion, or even really through the Catholic Church. It's It's really the Jesus that says, whatever you do to the least among us, you do to me, um, and love your neighbor. That's the message that he's after. He's not really, I read that Capra is not, I mean, he was a Catholic, but he did not go to church, and uh, he said he was a Christmas Catholic. (laughs) David, you brought us this movie. I want to ask you two questions. First of all, why did you pick Meet John Doe? Well, we've already had two people mention they hadn't even heard of it. And if you look at a list, like, let's say you just go online, you Google best Capra movies. This movie will show up on a few people's lists, but many lists don't even include it. But to me, I think it's the best Capra movie. It's my favorite, personally, anyway. And is that because of the political side of it, the emotional side of it? Is what in particular made it your favorite? I think it's the most cynical and yet the most idealistic. I mean, they're all idealistic, but this one goes the deepest into cynicism. And there's this battle between those two feelings all through the film. And I think this film is darker than any of the, I mean, It's a Wonderful Life is quite dark. Jimmy Stewart obviously wants to commit suicide and is pulled back from the brink of that. That's certainly dark. But this is really about the destruction of American democracy. I, I think it's so relevant to various times We've gone through this country, including right now, the whole idea of not being able to trust the press, of um, people that want to dismantle democracy. And also it's funnier than It's a Wonderful Life. So, you know, his earlier films are funnier than his later films, and this film's pretty funny. All right. So let me go to favorite scenes in the movie. We already hear a lot of support for favorite character being Barbara Stanwyck. Anybody here a fan of the Walter Brennan character, the colonel, the fellow hobo? He was funny. Yeah, he provides like the perfect amount of comedic relief. And I love his voice. Mm -hmm. He's also the only character that doesn't need to have a conversion. Mm -hmm. D.B. Norton, you're not sure. I mean, you can't imagine him really being converted, but 
he's feeling something at the end of that movie that he, is he know, backs off he backs off he backs most right. I'll give it. so the colonel is just the colonel all the way through never changes and he's also the only character who's not corrupted in the movie at all ever yeah he believes that money corrupts that as soon as you get money then you need insurance then you need a mortgage then you're in a rat race and yeah. and i'm listening to that going like oh oh god he's right yeah. yeah, he just revealed it as the scam that it is. <laughs> <laughs> so favorite scenes. Grace, did you have any particular scenes that stuck out to you? A shot that really sticks out in my mind is after John Doe gives his first speech and he doesn't do the other speech that the media wanted him to do. So he runs away with the colonel under their bridge that they were sleeping under. And I just thought that shot was so mesmerizing. I rewound it just so I could see that again, just under the bridge there. Because it looked so, I didn't even realize at first that was their encampment. And then I I was like, God, I want to be there. And then I saw they were just like being homeless under the bridge. And I was like, oh my God. (laughs) Sort of like an idyllic little world. Mm -hmm. Jake, what about you? Was there any scene in particular you'd want to... uh point out i think my favorite scene was in sort of the beginning part of the film when they're like picking out who their john doe's gonna be and there's all those people standing outside his office and then gary cooper's character comes in and he's like so handsome and dashing and like even in his rugged clothes there's like a sparkle in his eye i was like i'm in love with this homeless man (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> evidently a lot of women in hollywood were in love with that gary cooper as well mm-hmm. like he, was, he could stay scruffy i don't care <laughs> i did love the editor's drunken monologue that one i think sent out for its own reasons but i think the one that really enthralled me into the entire thing that i was just book line and sinker i was in was when they did the meet john doe club he's running away from people who want to talk to him and discuss him And then in order to convince him to keep going with the charade, they, you know, they bring in these people to convince him. And even though the motivation behind is kind of false to keep a false narrative going, it's just the way that these people talk to each other. And just, I I teared up. I think I shed two or three tears. Same. Yeah, it was just so sweet. And it's just like, I think that's just a measure that just so carries so well today. You used the term Capricorn earlier. Capra was known for being somewhat corny, but the redeeming aspect of Capra compared to other filmmakers who would imitate his corniness and making things seem everything's okay by the end is Capra takes you all the way down. Like he always takes you to the darkest place. I mean, he really takes you to this place of literally a fascist insurrection ginned up by the rich guy, which I don't know if that sounds like anything that might've happened a couple of years ago to any of you, but I was surprised at how relevant the film was fake news, uh, ginned up insurrection, millionaires or billionaires today funding quote-unquote grassroots organizations like the tea party about 15 years ago i mean this is all stuff that's still going on and it's crazy but the thing that blows me away is that the three of you were touched by some of the sentiments in here including the speech by the newspaper editor but what's fascinating is that the newspaper editor who's kind of helped set this thing in motion played by james gleason sits John Doe down in a bar before he gives a speech and drunkenly expresses his patriotism, talks about being in World War I, talks about those great men, Washington and Jefferson, and how he doesn't want to let them down. I get mad for a lot of other guys besides myself. I get mad for a guy named Washington and a guy named Jefferson and Lincoln. Lighthouses, John. Lighthouses in a foggy world. And he's basically had a crisis of conscience about what's going on here. And I think even in the 1960s and 70s, when you would see this film, it would feel like a little bit corny. But I still feel like there's something that appeals to our deepest values there, our values of patriotism and the idea, even though we know it's not always performed right, but the democracy that we live in, you know, the core fundamental ideals that at least I grew up with in a small town in upstate New York. I mean, that's what touched me about it. I mean, does that ring true with everybody? Well, yeah, Mm -hmm. I want to say that Capra acknowledges the double-sidedness of that. So, you know, he uses patriotism at the end, the bells ring, and there's a lot of 
Jesus, as we mentioned. Uh, but on the other hand, so that, that climactic scene is probably the most important scene in the movie in terms of what's at stake, is that he comes to deliver the speech and he's got to tell the people that even though he lied to them, he can explain why. And this is the moment where he can save the whole thing. And what interrupts him? He gets interrupted twice. First, he has to wait because they start playing God Bless America. So he's like, oh, okay. And they- It was actually <laughs> My Country, Tis of Thee. Okay. My Country, Tis of Thee. In Wrigley Field, whatever. Then he's ready to talk again. And then, oh, the priest comes up and says, a moment of silent prayer, please. And there's a whole minute where everyone has to be quiet. And then by then the stormtroopers have arrived and they cut the microphone and he never gets to explain himself to the people. So, you know, he's commenting there about how the trappings of patriotism and sanctimony can get in the way. Yeah, I think personally, when I watch a film where there's like any patriotism involved, I'm like, blech, you know what I mean? But this was showing another part where I was like, this democracy is kind of nasty. Like, what am I, what side am I on, you know? That's what the film's about. Mm -hmm. For me, what the editor was saying, I kind of took it as he wasn't about the John Doe club. He was kind of saying like, America's perfect. Why criticize it? You mean the James Gleason character? Yeah. When he, his like drunk monologue, maybe, maybe I misinterpreted that, but he was basically in my eyes saying, why are you criticizing America? But then I was also thinking like, that's what makes America great. You could criticize things. Um, but maybe I need to watch that again. But <laughs> I I was definitely not feeling patriotic, especially when the troopers came and cut off his mic and then were in the crowd trying to get people to boo at him. And it just like furthered this idea of how the police are really only there to serve and protect the rich, not the, the John Doe's of the world. Well, they're not real police. You know, they're his private military force. Yeah. So, Kyla, you were the first one to really mention the James Gleason editor, drunken patriotic speech. So what was it about it that affected you? I think it was earlier he questioned D.B. Norton. He was the first one to be like, something's going on. What are you getting out of this? You're a rich guy. You own all these things. And um, I think I kind of was like, okay, he's someone I need to listen to. I need to pay attention to. Even though he fired Barbara at the beginning, he took her back. He could be convinced. So I was like, okay, this, this guy's not making sense to me. I can't tell what side he's on. And he's always, you know, on his own side. But I think what struck the chord for me is knowing that he is a World War I veteran. Him and his father entered the war together. And he's super drunk. He can't even light his cigarette. It's funny, but it's heartbreaking. And he kind of shows Gary Cooper, I think I need to stand up for something. But here's this man who survived World War I without a scratch. He watched his father die. Him and his father were equals in war. But when he comes home, here is his family without a father. They showed up in the same uniform. And it's like, if he can come to terms with this in some way, or he can find a bright side or a way to cope with it, in a way, he has the choice to do that. And I think that presented Gary Cooper's character with the choice of, do I stand up or do I let this corrupt man win and capitalize on the everyday people? Because the everyday people, the John Doe's, are the ones who have to go to war in this instance. Mm. So he's like, well, you know what? I might need to stand up for them because they don't know how this message could hurt them. Mm. And I think that was his call to action that vulnerability from this hardened man. And I think that was why I loved it so much because it was just a call to action in the weirdest way from the character you didn't know you loved until then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally agree. By the way, do you remember what the editor does at the end of the scene after all the drinking? He says he needs to, like, he's smoking too much. (laughs) And he orders some milk. (laughs) (laughs) He orders a glass of milk. So is there anything about this film that in particular felt dated to you guys? The very, very end of Barbara's speech for me. It was the collapsing. Oh, that she kind of faints into his arms. Yeah, and I was like, (laughs) girl, you are John Doe. Like, you're the brains behind this. You are the person who ignited this flame and you're collapsing in his arms. He's something because of you. Like, don't Mm -hmm. rely on him. You're falling into his arms when he should be falling into yours and thanking you. Yes, Mm -hmm. I was thinking the same thing. Their relationship in general was like what was dated for me Mm -hmm. and the way their connection was portrayed. Yeah. 
I agree. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting, too, just as a story point, she's having trouble writing the speeches for John Doe until her mother brings her diary from the dead father, which also brings up the fact that the family's kind of struggling without having the father as the breadwinner in the family. And it's part of why she has to be uh, successful as a newspaper woman. And it turns out that all of John Doe's speeches are Anne's character funneling her father's words into John Doe, which creates kind of an interesting Oedipal. Um, yeah, the dream, the dream part, the spanking for like 20 minutes. Yeah, that was I'm like, so weird and I'm uncomfortable. Like, yeah. Yeah, I dreamed that was your dad. And I'm like, no, but I thought you guys liked each other. <laughs> what is up with this dad thing? <laughs> I was completely embarrassed watching Gary Cooper <laughs> tell Barbara Stanwyck the story about that dream story where he ends up trying to spank some sense into her and he's kind of being jolly about it until the guy comes up behind him and stops him. And she's kind of laughing along with it. Like, oh, you guys. So then in real life, I'd be like, I'm calling the police. <laughs> Are you OK? Yeah. Oh, my God. I think that happened with Jonathan Majors recently. We got to stop this. <laughs> Yeah. Also, uh, you know, we don't have Guy here who normally counts the number of African American characters in the movie. I counted one, mm. and it's mm -hmm. the guy no, who's. No, no. There's two, two, yeah. Okay, well, there's the the embarrassing scene to me was the one with the janitor and the cigar, and for some reason, when all the people show up, he puts the cigar lit under his hat, and then when they leave, he pulls it out and starts smoking again. And I guess it was a comic bit that probably really cracked him up back in. 1941 before <laughs> the end of segregation by about 20 years. But um, I think the problem is the casting and the way that, you know, that actor, uh, you know, borrowed this sort of form of humor from uh, traditional minstrel shows and all the kinds of black humor in white plays and movies that have gone before, because, you know, he's rolling his eyes and he's hamming it up in this way. But I think that what he's doing is, you know, he's just trying to enjoy a cigar. And then like these people come and he's a janitor, so he has to hide it. I think that's actually, I kind of felt sympathy for him. Mm -hmm. It's just that uh, he made himself a bit too much of a clown. Yeah, that felt dated for sure. And Very then much. there was another Black character. Well, not a character, but you see um, some help in the mansion after John Doe is like sticking it to him you know and then the the workers are in the background like whoa yeah you mm -hmm. just said amazing stuff and a lot of them are like minorities so so let me ask a question with these old movies because there's a few others like this one of my favorites high sierra which is a great humphrey bogart Ida Lupino movie has some incredibly embarrassing stuff with stefan fetchick playing a similar character do you think that for today's audiences those things should be cut out of the movies? Or do you think you just need to contextualize or or what? I think they should be left in because we can all wrap our heads around the fact that times were different back then and it's obviously not acceptable to portray characters in that way. And it would be a disservice to cut it out because it's just hiding our past, really. We should mm -hmm. leave it in and learn from it. Yeah, I agree. I think there are certain things that don't necessarily need to be seen, can be talked about given context, like graphic, horrible stuff. But for the most part, I think when I look back at films and there's these dated tropes and stereotypes and stuff like that, I'm like, oh my God, what the hell was wrong with these people? But it also like places me back and I start thinking about how minorities and queer folks and stuff like that were thought of by mainstream society. So I think it's important to keep, but I think there should be some things that don't necessarily need to be shown. Where would you draw the line? Like, I don't think that like we need to keep blackface in films. Like it can be talked about and we can give it context and history, but I don't think that like people need to be watching films like that and being like, this is my favorite movie. <laughs> and then there's a scene with blackface in it. I'm like, are you good? If today your favorite movie is a movie, you know, with blackface, right. you know, that's odd. That would be odd. I mean, you're probably really a racist uh, if you find that to be so delightful. But there are or, so many films too that have like, I forget what the actor's name is, but he's portraying an Asian character and he's like 
got his face all skewn up. Mickey Rooney and Breakfast at Tiffany's. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. particularly offensive. My, I mean, I cringed when I saw that in the 60s or 70s. Yeah, I'm like, who thought this was a good idea? I need to meet this person. I think that's something that's so hard from a cinema studies perspective. Um, when I take the race, class, and gender, one thing that they emphasize is that the role of cinema studies, it is to make sure that we understand why that was shown. Maybe, you know, it shouldn't be on ABC Family or shown on a network broadcast these films, but it's important that people who make films watch this. And it's a way of preserving in a way of learning from history, just so you don't repeat it further. Well, the word that comes to mind is the word context. And I think that if you're able to provide context and show things in the right context, you know, you're right. If it's on ABC Family, it's like, what? But if it's on Turner Classic Movies and Jacqueline Stewart is introducing it and explaining why the character of Mammy or Butterfly McQueen's characters were treated a certain way and gone with the wind, it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So this is a movie that we all pretty much agree has a big political message. It's talking about democracy writ large. It's talking about threats to democracy from capital. And it's talking about how easy it is to manipulate the population if you're able to grab a populist figure, for example, and bend that person to your needs. Also, if you can use, you know, the newspapers and the radio then were the media. I mean, that was the most powerful communication tool at the time, those two. So that was everything. If you controlled the papers and the radio, you know. So here's my question though. What John Doe is espousing that inspires everybody seems to me like the most apolitical political thing you could think of. It's just basically be nice to the guy next door. Be nice to your neighbors. The big scene, Kylie, that you mentioned where real people come and try to convince John Doe not to quit being John Doe, the guy says, there's Mr. Grumpy next door. He was always a sourpuss. But thanks to you, I went over and I said hello to him. And he went, huh? And I realized he was just deaf, hard of hearing. And then he had a big smile and now he's our friend. And look, here he is here. He's here with us now. And you got to stay, John, and all this stuff. So, you know, to what degree does it matter that the thing that John Doe is fighting for or promulgating is essentially as unpolitical and unoffensive as one could potentially put into this movie? Am I wrong about that? No. I thought it had hints of communism honestly like the collectivism and just the critique on capitalism in this time where we were going through the red scare i thought it was pretty interesting so capra you know was a republican which meant a different thing back then he's clearly progressive right he's for the little guy he's suspicious of uh you know the rich uh especially the rich that want to try to control politics and control the country um, he's suspicious of politicians. He talks about taxes being a kind of reprehensible thing. Um, and uh, so it doesn't fit as neatly into the Democratic and Republican slots that we have today of right and left. Things have shifted a bit. So maybe like whatever he's putting in John Doe's mouth is essentially nonpartisan. Yeah. Very unifying. It is unifying, and it's definitely about sharing power mm -hmm. properly. What he's most suspicious of is people that have too much power. He says politicians are corrupted by their power. So today, that's not the Republican message, but in his day, he could be a Republican and still feel that way. Um, and he has a lot of conservative values. Yeah, and also back then, the Democratic Party before the end of segregation was the party of the, of the South, of the Civil War, of the original slave party. And yeah. arguably more corrupt. They used immigrants for kind of corrupt means, you know, uh, as we all know. So it was a different system then, but similar. It felt to me almost like the particular message that John Doe was giving was the MacGuffin, to use a Alfred Hitchcock term. It's the object that really doesn't mean anything, but keeps the plot going, that allows us to follow. And I thought it was interesting because I think that somebody making the movie today might be called out if they didn't make uh, take a real political stand of some sort on something. I You don't feel like he takes a political stand? Well, I think that the John Doe political stand that the character is taking about being kind to your neighbor, 
it's more of something to hang all the other political criticism on, which is more about the system, right? And, and more shown than told. I do think there is a germ of what Grace is saying, though. I don't know if I go so far as to say that it's communist, but maybe not totally communist, just like specs of the ideal, you know. What I think it brings up to me is an idea that I feel like is sometimes lost today, which is the idea of the common good. A lot of people on the right will sneer at the idea of the common good, but somebody like Franklin Roosevelt was like, look, we have a big depression going on. We're all in this together. Rich have to help out too. Everybody has to help. We got to try to raise everybody. Let's create social security so everybody's grandmother doesn't end up in poverty. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and to me, that was, if there's anything in the John Doe message, and again, I separate that from the overall political message of the film as borne out by the use of stormtroopers and all that stuff. I think that's probably the most risque thing about the whole thing is just saying like, look, being kind to your neighbor is a way of agreeing that we should all help each other and lift each other up. Which I feel is a progressive message. Um, but at the same time, I don't personally think of it as communist because they didn't allow politicians into their clubs. And um, so there was a strong idea of individual liberty and of not subjecting people to central authority or to the authority at all of politicians, right. which is quite the opposite of communism. I thought personally, a lot of it was kind of following the immigrant story of when you come to America, just like Capra's family, you kind of do have to rely on your community of the people to support each other with a shared and common creed, whether that be the common good or just trying to get by and give each other some milk or sugar if you need it. Mm -hmm. Hmm. It reminds me of a story my great grandma used to tell me when she lived off of some railroad tracks, a lot of like homeless hobos, she called them, would come through and like do some yard work for her. And then she would give them a meal and just have them go on their way. And I thought about that when they were feeding John Doe and he was just eating all the eggs. And it, it just reminded me of my great grandma's story. It seemed like such a more innocent time. I feel like today someone would have gotten shot. Yeah. You know, hobo at my door. What? <laughs> Not in Florida. No, I mean... <laughs> That's sad. A lot of people in LA don't want it either. You know, it's all over. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. I agree with you totally. I read that this was Capra's first independent film of three yeah. independent films he created. And then while I was doing the research, I realized that he had directed It Happened One Night, which was one of my favorite films, if not my favorite. And then throughout watching it, I was like kind of almost drawing parallels to the way he filmed or the way he directed, I guess. Interesting. So, Jake, since you loved Happen One Night so much, what do you notice about the way Capra shoots films? Because it's something I want to talk about later, but I'd first like to hear what you have to say. What I liked about It Happened One Night is the like way that the couple together is glamorized by the lighting. I love Claudette Colbert, and I think she has such a beautiful face. So the first time I watched that film, I was like starstruck by her because of the way he just like uses the shadow of her face, you know? And he really did that with Barbara too. And like, I don't know what kind of lighting it is, but I loved the part when she's at the typewriter and the lights dim behind her and it's just like a focus on her face. The way he uses the studio in such an obvious way for, from a film student's perspective, we're like, oh, they're dimming the lights. But while you're watching the film, you're not even thinking about the lights dimming, you're just suddenly focused on her. Yeah and maybe what she's thinking about or typing. I love the way he uses like these obvious elements to like bring you in. But yeah, if that I, makes sense. <laughs> I love it. Yes, I love it. And then Kylie, can you tell us anything about the reception of the film back then and maybe even how that may have changed over time? Uh, yes. So I know at the time it didn't perform amazing at the box office compared to some of his other films. I think it was the second lowest grossing film of his collection. Uh, 1.8 million, but overall people enjoyed it. Everyone always says throughout the 40s, 50s, 60s, even till now, technically this is a masterpiece. But people kind of started to have some issues, especially with the ending and how they kind of wanted it to be more of Barbara Stanwyck's story and how, mm -hmm. of course, Gary Cooper, he's beautiful, he's gorgeous, but a lot of people wanted more of Barbara and they wanted to see her as more of the mastermind and they kind of didn't like how she's the one who was framed to fall to the material objects. 
even though that kind of contradicts a lot of what her character is all about. And then contemporary audiences also didn't totally love um, the dialogue I read a lot about in a lot of the more recent reviews. They kind of felt that they could have honed it back, but I do think it's, again, the Capricorn is so contemporary audiences might not like it, but that's what he liked. That was his style. That's what made him famous. Um, and then also audiences from all decades wish that Gary Cooper's character did kill himself. Wow. Um, yeah. They were like, I, it would have been more impactful. But I then, was kind of thinking that. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to say yeah. that. That was the original mm-hmm. ending. Yeah. That was what they wrote. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then they tested it. And the audiences of that time hated it. Uh, they mm-hmm. didn't want Gary Cooper killed. <laughs> yeah. He was too big a star. And mm-hmm. it, it was too much of a downer for them. Exactly. Yeah. I found the exact quote where he's just like, you can't kill Gary Cooper. And <laughs> so you just can't do it. They actually got nominated for an Academy Award of this film for Best Original Screenplay. And it was a year where Stanwyck and Cooper were actually both nominated for separate films that year. And Cooper actually won Best Actor as well. So it didn't go totally unrecognized, the talent in the film, but Citizen Kane as well came out the same year. Uh, it's funny, Cooper didn't know how to play baseball, right? So they spent a lot of time <laughs> working on that. And then a the year later, he made Pride of the Yankees, where he had to bat oh. left-handed. Um, and he's a righty. It's so hard that they actually flipped the film. Wow. Um, and then wow. all the signs in the, in the Yankee Stadium were, were mirrored so that when they <laughs> flipped it, the signs would read the right way. Mm-hmm. Nice. I want to talk for a second about the technical side of it. I mean, to me, the blowaway scenes were the big, huge convention scenes. And I kept thinking, like, how much of this was captured at like a Democratic or Republican convention and how much of this was being staged? And there's a lot of it that he staged. I mean, back then, I guess extras were cheaper than they are now and they weren't digital. (laughs) He filled Wrigley Field with extras. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And that kind of takes me to this whole section here where the speech starts at the big convention and David's going through the things that lead up to Gary Cooper trying to speak. And then when DB shows up, he actually gets into a live debate with DB and DB clearly is ready with all the arguments, all the things to discredit John Doe. And John is a regular guy. He's not Matt Damon in Goodwill Hunting, right? He's not the guy who's going to come back with the facts and figures and blow DB off the stage. He's the guy who you know, he's trying to get his thoughts together and he's under pressure and he can't really do it. And DB essentially browbeats him and turns the crowd against him and then juices it with some of his stormtroopers starting uh, booze and making people go along with it. And that is a super dark part of this movie, right? And then the whole story has been all along that John was going to throw himself off the roof of the news building on Christmas Eve. And, you know, it's now several months, it seems, after the failed convention, which turned into a riot. But there's more than one group of people that are thinking that John Willoughby is going to maybe try to commit suicide that night. And so the climax is on Christmas Eve and you end up on the roof. And I will never forget those scenes of John on the roof. There's something about the way it's staged and the open space and the sense that he could jump. And you've got DB showing up with his crowd. And first, I didn't realize that DB was with the crowd. But DB's there to take away this last thing. John is saying, I'm going to kill myself. And that's going to inspire everybody all over again. And DB saying, no, it won't, because I'll make sure that your body is swept away in moments. And any letter that you've written will destroy. And he basically unmans him one last time in this huge way. At the same time, You got Barbara Stanwyck running to get there and try to save him because she thinks he's going to jump off the roof. And you've got the people, right? A group of people that are represent the general population, the ones who formed the John Doe clubs that believed in his message. And they show up and they become the saving grace of the movie. They become the thing that keeps, along with Barbara Stanwyck's speech, the thing that keeps John from jumping off the roof. And, you know, Is it corny or is it moving? Like, you know, it's it's such an interesting take on the general populace and kind of bold to show them with some degree of personality, no? I thought it was very moving and it just made the whole message more meaningful because even though it was based on a lie, it was still like the truth at its core. And it was amazing that the average Joe was able to see through that and realize that this man's life is still important, even if he was lying. 
I think what's interesting about what you said, Mark, about deciphering whether it's corny or it's touching. The question I'm asking myself is why are we seeing people banding together and supporting each other and being like, oh, corny? <laughs> you know, I, for me, whenever I see that, I'm like, oh, that's beautiful. But then there's also this weird natural reaction where I'm like, yikes, why am I looking at this? You know what I mean? But it's so sweet and genuine. And I think we're expecting to see like something with more of an edge than like the sweet touch. Such a great observation, Jake. I mean, you know, that is the question is why is it so difficult for people to love one another mm. and to accept one another? David, you did some research into Frank Capra himself. Can you briefly kind of tell us a little bit about him that might illuminate some of what we've been talking about? Yeah, um, he was born in Sicily and he had a uh, seven, I think, siblings. And uh, they all moved to the U.S. when he was about five years old. They lived in an Italian ghetto, essentially, on the east side of L.A. And he had a hard upbringing. You know, they didn't have money. He actually went to Caltech and studied engineering. Very, very, very bright man. Brilliant, actually. And talented, of course. And he was the only person in his family that wasn't making a living because they were working as bricklayers and, you know, construction, all that. And he was trying to be an engineer and, you know, he didn't have the right background to get a job as an engineer. Something that happened to my grandfather, who was Jewish, went to engineering school. And when he went to get jobs, they said, we don't take Jews. And I think this happened to Capra as well. We don't take Italians. Yeah. So um, he started working in the movies and just got in early when there were silent films. He worked for Harry Cohn, who started Columbia Pictures, which was a small indie outfit. Um, and Harry Cohn is a legendary figure. Everybody was afraid of Harry Cohn. I mean, he just terrorized everyone who worked for him. And Capra apparently was one of the only people that ever stood up to him and would never let himself get bullied. And Cohn really respected that. Uh, Mel Brooks tells this great story about Harry Cohn was in a big barber chair, right? And I uh, was surrounded by his minions. And Brooks says, the barber would like turn the barber chair around, use it like a piece of mobile artillery to point it at whoever Harry Cohn was gonna scream huh. at. And, uh, you know. He's a weapon. <laughs> yes. Was that the one where the Harry Cohn, when he died, he had this huge funeral and tons of people showed up and Groucho Marx says, well, when you give the people what they want. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> a tough, That's tough terrible. guy. But Frank Capra helped make Columbia Pictures into a major studio. And when Capra left to make Meet John Doe, Harry Cohn sent him a telegram that simply said, you'll be back. Uh, but he never went back. Mm -hmm. um, so one last thing is that shortly before this film was made, Capra's very young son, I think he was two and a half years old, died during a routine tonsillectomy. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. And he was in a bit of a dark place himself. But I did want to talk about what Jake and uh, others have alluded to, which is the techniques he used. Because I think as a technician and as a skillful director, people always talk about his stories and, um, you know, the emotion, all that. But they don't talk about how he achieved that. And I think he was really quite brilliant at that. So, you know, one of his innovations was having people talk at the same time. Mm -hmm. He was the first director to have overlapping dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess what I want to go into is some of the techniques in this movie. The Capra touch consists of a lot of things. First of all, there are Capra scenes that nobody else does. Like that scene where they're playing fake baseball. They stop the whole movie for them to play baseball, but without a ball. And everyone's watching. In a hotel room. In a hotel room, right. That's such a Capra scene. The harmonic and the ocarina, that's very Capra-esque. And then the colonel, calling will be out when he tries to use that bit to change the subject, and then suddenly the colonel isn't buying it. Norton wiping his glasses, all these bits that he throws in. And it has a very strong feeling. So the way that Norton is introduced, it's a long time before you see him. You see jackhammering of the cornerstone. You see people being laid off in this horrible manner. You see all these tense phone calls. And then when you finally meet him, he's like the calmest, speaks slowly and with a lot of gravity. And you know he's the boss because everyone else is rushing around like a chicken without a head, trying to get somewhere and trying to succeed. And he's not, he's already succeeded. 
And that pacing, that musical pacing, where as the tension builds, the cutting gets faster, the action gets faster, people talk faster. It just, you know, even by today's standards, it's cut very quickly. And then there's always these scenes, and this is what you don't get today in most films, is that quiet where suddenly there's no sound and they're just out in the country or you're just looking at someone's face and two people are just looking at each other. There's no music mm. and there's no talking. And suddenly it's like you're there. And that draws you in, I think, in a really remarkable way. And he really uses music minimally, actually. So in comic scenes, he uses silly music to kind of lighten the mood. But when it comes to the most emotional scenes, there aren't really strings or anything that people say he's sappy, but he avoids sappy music mm. until the end when the bells ring. <laughs> but all these really, really emotional scenes happen in silence. And I, I love that. I was taken by that because one, it's very rare, I think, to have a moment of silence where like the blanket is ripped off of you and you're like, oh God, what's what's happening? Or like, it's forcing me to think about what's happening in the scene now and grapple with like the emotion lingering in the scene. I'm almost feeling what the characters are feeling because there's nothing prompting me to feel any other way except for about what I'm seeing. So I really enjoyed that. And then I think that the way that he introduced music in the film was really smart. And it wasn't just like this filler sound every time there was music in the film. It was very purposeful. Also, the, the use of soft focus, it goes from hard focus to soft focus. You hardly notice it. But instead of using schmaltzy music, you kind of notice the focus gets soft and you get closer to people's faces. And maybe the actors seem like they're on the verge of some emotion that they don't want to show. Mm. Also, very often when it gets to the most emotional moment, the person who's talking often you just see the back of their head or you see the person they're talking to instead of seeing them. He uses those reaction shots a lot. And those get to the emotion often a lot more than the person who's speaking. And he draws on all that. He's very, very skilled and very manipulative. And this movie is one of his masterpieces in that way. Must be a lot of the silent movie training, especially for the little comic bits and the little character pieces. Yeah. I wanna mention something else too. Did anyone notice there's two montage sequences in the film, which are kind of classic 1940s montages with a lot of things happening really fast, newspapers coming by, you know, kind of moving the story forward in about 30 seconds to a minute, something like that. Those were created by Slaka Vorkopic, the master of the montage. He did all these techniques that were completely new that we still use today. He would shoot things in interesting ways. There's one where you see John Doe just walking forward and the camera just keeps moving back with him while all this other stuff is dissolving around him, telling you what's going on. Vorkopich ended up becoming head of the cinema department at USC in his later years. And there are people that are Vorkopich fans that just collect his montages. I'm sure you can find them on YouTube. But they're kind of a whole new kind of grammar for mm -hmm. film that he was the father of. They went out of style at some point. They are still used today, but not, not to tell the story in a quick way. Although, you know, in romantic comedies, they do that. They're, they're laughing on the beach and all that stuff. That's, that's mm -hmm. still around. Yeah, there's something very special about the way he kind of deals with, yes. with time and all that. All right, guys, I think we've come to the point in our show where it's time to lay it on the line. The two questions are, who would you recommend this film to, if anybody? And also, on a scale of one to four stars, how will you rate it? The way this system works is four stars is not just a great movie, but one that's touched you personally, that would be in your top, let's call it 30, maybe 50. And three and a half stars is an A movie. It's all many, many great movies there. A minus is three stars, no shame. Then you get down to the Bs with two and a half and two stars, whether it's a B plus or a B minus. And we don't show you movies that are, are lower than that, I don't believe. So for this one, I'm going to go again to Grace and ask you to tell us uh, what your rating is for the film and how likely you would be to recommend it to who. I'm going to give it a 3.5. I really loved it. I think it still resonates today. 
and it has just an incredible message that needs to be shared and I would recommend it to anyone who's just craving community um, because I definitely am and this film really speaks about that like getting to know your neighbors I just feel like that's something we don't have in our day and age at all and and I feel like a lot of people are really craving that so I would recommend it to anyone who wants that or has problems with capitalism i guess <laughs> <laughs> uh jake what about you really similarly three and a half and i think that i would recommend it to those people in my life who are really like politically motivated or who are involved in activism i could see the people that i know who are that way screaming at the screen you know so also, I'm now I'm wondering, my grandmother lives across the hall. I have to go and ask her if she's watched this film, because I think she'd love it. Mm. Kylie, our new guest, first time on the panel here. Who would you recommend the film to, if anyone? And how would you rate it? I would rate it a 3.5, definitely. It's a good, solid movie, and it's a great watch. And I would probably recommend it, actually, specifically to my dad, because he raised us on It's a Wonderful Life. And I think that this is just a perfect film for me to show him in turn for it. But again, yeah, anyone really looking just for something to feel good and a little bit of hopefulness, a little sense of reality as well, but definitely my dad. And would you say that your father really helped introduce you to cinema, might have gotten you on the direction that led you to your degree? Uh, yeah, actually, my dad is a boom operator. And then my grandfather was a sound mixer since like um, Gunsmoke was one of his first jobs. Oh my God. Um, so definitely my family is just living third generation Angelino. So my dad is the reason why I definitely love film so much. Oh my God. That just moves my awesome. heart. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> David, this was your pick. I want to see where you come down on it. Oh, there's no mystery for me. It's a four. It's definitely one of my top. It's on my top 20 list without any doubt. We've talked a lot about how you should see these movies in theaters that's true of any movie you should see in a theater. As Capra himself said, the audience are the ones that complete the film. They're the final editors of the film, the final makers. But I think this is a film you can watch by yourself or, or with a close friend on your TV set. You know, find a good print. Just so you know, the best print available right now, and it's very hard to find good prints. It went into the public domain and the negative was pretty much destroyed. And so almost all the prints were made out of lousy other prints. Uh, but now with digital, there have been some restorations. And the best way to see it right now, believe it or not, it's on YouTube. There's a 4K restoration that I urge you to watch it on if you're going to watch it. And this is a movie that I can sit with alone in my room and watch. And I'll get choked up. I'll laugh. Maybe out loud at places. If you watch it with your buddies, and particularly if you're younger, it might be embarrassing almost to love it in the way I love it because it is a little corny and it is telling you to love the person next to you. And that's a hard message maybe when you're really in that moment in the theater. It's, I don't know, certainly a lot of guys might be uncomfortable with that, maybe mm -hmm. women too. But when you're alone, it's a good movie to see if you're feeling lonely or if maybe not lonely, but just want to feel something. And I recommend it, of course, to anybody who loves good writing, great dialogue. I mean, we didn't talk about some of the lines in the movie. Robert Riskin wasn't even mentioned. And I mean, when the Colonel says, gangway, you helots. <laughs> and the last line where he says, there you are, Norton, the people, try and lick that. You know, these are just great lines. Mm -hmm. My favorite line, the first line that caused me to perk up, Barbara Stanwyck comes back and explains to the editor how they're going to do the John Doe scam is really trying to convince him. And he's saying, no, no, no. And finally she convinces him. And he says, she packs everything, even the gun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love a lot of snappy dialogue in this. Mm -hmm. Robert Riskin's mm -hmm. a great, he wrote almost all of Capra's films. Yeah. And by the way, has anyone here seen Double Indemnity, my favorite Barbara Stanwyck performance? Yes. She's dynamite. She's mm -hmm. dynamite. She's dynamite. Phyllis, right? I think the parts where he has the dialogue overlapping, I wonder if that was purposefully like maddening because there's moments where I was almost missing what they were saying because I'm like overstimulated. You know what I mean? 
And all that cacophony of voices and the really fast stuff. And then it contrasts so much with when Regis Toomey has that endless monologue about how they formed the John Doe societies mm. and how much it meant to the community. You know, I mean, it, it, it's so the opposite. And there's this moment where the old woman comes up to John Willoughby, who feels like a rat because he knows he's a liar. And she takes his hand and she kisses his hand. She says, God bless you, John Doe. And, you know, there's no music. And, and it's really on him, not her. His face looking guilty. Um, just another good moment. Again, what separates Capra's form of sentimentalism from the cheap followers who would throw on music and try to push buttons too easily. All right. As always, I'll take pole position over here. And as far as recommending it, I think I would recommend it to people that are interested in film history, people that are interested in politics. I don't know if it's for everybody, because I think there's some people that would be put off by the black and white. My feelings about this film completely changed from before I watched it this week. I have last seen it probably in college, but two things really struck me. There's a point in the film where they get to the convention and I was blown away. I just thought, first of all, handling these huge crowds and going so dark on the fascism, the idea of wealth-backed fascism at a time when in Europe, fascism was triumphant. You know, Grace mentioned the moment when the colonel and John Doe are sitting under the bridge. And there's two times where it happens. One happens early and one happens later. But the later one after the convention is the one that's really interesting because John is quiet and brooding and he's thinking. And you kind of feel like maybe he's really thinking for the first time. And the colonel for the first time is deferential. He's kind of backing off and letting John think. And that's the moment where Gary Cooper's performance just kicks into gear, where he, without histrionics, gives us a sense of a man with a purpose, with a plan. And that whole last scene on top of the roof, like I said, it's iconic. And I remember it from my childhood before I even saw the whole movie. So to me, that was very powerful. And the other thing that really strikes me is the reason that we do generation film is to see how these ancient movies play to a younger group, admittedly a younger group that does like movies to start with. But the fact that the three of you all gave it three and a half stars, an A-list movie for each one of you, and that you related to the message, you related to the politics, you related to the craft and the characters. It's definitely a 3.5 for me, which gives us, with David's four, a 3.6 average, so essentially a 3.5. This is an A-list movie for us over here. And uh, those are my feelings about it. David, thank you so much for making this pick. I was so skeptical at first. But I went with my instinct, which is trust my partner on the podcast. Well, <laughs> in some ways, it's a, it's too good to be a guilty pleasure. But I know that for a lot of people, it's not the Capra film that everyone talks about, but it should be. I mean, I think I get more choked up at the end of It's a Wonderful Life. But mm -hmm. the power of the political message in this one and how bold it was for its time is kind of blow away for me. And I think the political message is so powerful the way that the system is being manipulated by the wealthy guys behind the scenes. I know we're almost done, but there's one thing that's pretty famous that should be mentioned. Robert Riskin and Capra couldn't come up with an ending and they were shooting the film and Riskin kept saying to Capra, we don't have an ending. We've painted ourselves in a corner. We've got a real problem here. And Capra said, don't worry, it'll be all right. And then when they got to the ending, John Doe throws himself off the roof of City Hall and dies. And as I mentioned, uh, audiences hated it. <laughs> so he came up with two other endings and he shot those two and tested them all. And nobody liked any of the endings. And some guy, anonymous to this day, wrote a letter saying, Dear Mr. Capra, John Doe can only be saved by the people that believed in John Doe. Signed, John Doe. And he read that letter and immediately gathered his cast and his crew back together, and he shot the scene that you see now, which was shot in an ice house, so that uh, you'd see the breath, and it would really seem like it's in the winter in the snow. It's on the soundstage, of course. Wow. Thank you so much, David, not just for bringing the film here, but for all the knowledge that you brought about it and the passion. And I want to thank everybody I love this here. this group. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> 
I love this group too. Uh, so if you want to stream Meet John Doe for yourself, it's currently available on Amazon Prime Video and in various places in various quality with various commercial breaks on YouTube. So <laughs> look oh, for okay, the-, the version I found 4K restoration. It has a color logo, but the film is in the original black and white and there were no commercials. I'm going to watch that version again tonight. Yeah, I saw that one. That one was great. Speaking of YouTube, you can find Generation Film there with clips and stills for the full audio video experience. It's also on audio wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. If you like our show, please tell your friends. Please rate and review the show so others can find us as well. Generation Film is an Electrocast production. I'd like to thank our panelists, Grace Chapman, Jake Flowers, and special guest Kaylee LaRue. We'd love to have you back again. Me too. <laughs> as well as my co-host, David Tauzik, who not only co-hosts, but puts in all the hard work as producer, working with our editor, Marcus Campito, to edit both the video and the audio versions of Generation Film. Our executive producers are myself, Mark Netter, and my partner at Electrocast, Peter Rafelson. Please join us on our next episode, where we will see how another classic film, Stanley Kubrick's Vietnam War head trip Full Metal Jacket plays for a new generation of movie lovers here on Generation Film. Electric Ass.